And just one more note to those who are slowly starting to join us that we will give it another couple minutes. Uh, welcome to the uh, Stimson webinar, Leading the Blueprint, International Perspectives uh, on Blockchain for Nuclear Security. We will start in a couple of minutes time. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're coming from. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on leading the blueprint, uh, sorry, for international perspectives uh, on blockchain for international, sorry, for nuclear security. Uh, it is a pleasure to welcome all attendees. Uh, I see that we have a breadth uh, of attendees from all over the world. Uh, it is a pleasure to welcome you to this event. Uh, we have been, uh, my name, sorry, is Cindy Vestergaard. I'm the director of the Simpson Center's Blockchain in Practice program. And through our journey in looking at the potential for DLT, distributed ledger technology, uh, also commonly known as blockchain, but blockchain is really a subset uh, of DLT. We've come across, we initially thought that maybe we were one of the only ones, uh, and we are thankfully part of more of about a handful who are studying the potential for DLT in nuclear security applications. And so we have a wonderfully diverse panel today. We have uh, six speakers from five different countries. And so we're working also across a number of different time zones from Finland to Jordan uh, to Argentina to DC and also Venice, California. And with that, I will actually just uh, spend some time introducing first um, our speakers. But first, I want to introduce Gabrielle Green, who is the host of the event. Uh, Gabby is the uh, research associate for the Blockchain and Practice program. Gabby, do you want to say just a couple of words uh, to everybody who's attending? Sure. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, whether it's your morning, afternoon, or evening. We really appreciate it. And just a reminder, if you'd like to use the Q&A function, please send it to all panelists or to me as the host. Great, thank you, Gabby. So what we will do first is we, uh, the first part will be dedicated to uh, a section more on what is DLT, and we have two blockchain developers who are with us today. We have uh, Kim Anderson and Brennan Isabel. Kim is a founder and president and founder of uh, InkQ. She has been a long hired gun for executives pivoting to technologies for profitability. She was previously an executive at a multi-billion dollar telecom company, staging it for eventual acquisition by Verizon. She is also a non-resident fellow uh, at the Simpson Center. Brennan is a director for enterprise solutions at ORRO. Brennan, I hope I got that right. I have a hard time getting my, my mouth around that one. And uh, Brennan's background is in private equity and venture capital investments. Prior to this, he was uh, a strategic and operations consultant at Deloitte. Uh, and he holds an MBA in finance from Dalhousie University and a BBA from St. Francis Xavier University. So a fellow Canadian, which is always nice to have uh, on, on the panel. So I will turn it over to Kim first uh, and then to Brennan. And then we will go uh, next into looking at potential blueprint or what it could look like. And then next into a couple of uh, use cases. So Kim, over to you. Hi, I'm Kim Anderson. I'm president of NQ and non-resident fellow of Stimson's. So today we'll be talking uh, about blockchain and other smart technologies, and I'll share with you some of the ways that we use them.
Um, was I supposed to start my presentation? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Get that. I guess Anderson, huh? <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, let me share my screen with you. Can you guys see my screen? Uh, can you see my screen, my full screen? Yes, Kim, we can. You just need to make it into a presentation style, please. Thank you. Can you see it now? All right. So, so on the left, you'll see a traditional model. So when a buyers and suppliers transact, each has their own accounting systems, their own service delivery systems, their own paper invoices. So if there's a dispute, each has their own evidence of what happened. It takes time, effort, and money to resolve. Using the blockchain model on the left, on the right, a blockchain records its transaction to a distributed ledger using a hash, which cannot be altered. So see that uh, purple text on the slide? That's a blockchain hash. It holds an immutable record of the transaction and it will return an error if altered. The blockchain hash is your trust, transparency, and consensus for that transaction. So a member of the blockchain can authenticate the transactions and have trust in it. IoT, it's everywhere. Some of us have it. Refrigerators that connect to the internet, household heating, cooling systems that talk to the internet, toaster ovens, ring doorbells that record everything. Our US highways have electronic toll monitoring, sensors that measure our speed, location, or vehicle weight, or vehicle emissions, the number of people in the vehicle. What NQ does is that we tie all those sensors together into a blockchain neighborhood. Take something out, put something in, the blockchain hash is broken, racks go up. Now imagine the use of this technology in the nuclear world, in the intelligence world, in new censored, not recognized, a sensor removed or substituted. We need governance behind this. So if you look at that, and in closing, what you really want to see is that smart technologies need governance, compliance, you know, the algorithm deployment, the cybersecurity controls, identity management for the sensors. We authenticate each sensor to ensure the integrity of the device because customers have to have trust in the solution, trust in the data that it emits. So that just, just give you a sense of what blockchain can do, a smart technology can do with the IoT today. With that, I think I will hand it over back to Gabby. Actually, we will be passing the baton, so to speak, over to uh, Brennan. So, Kim, if you can stop sharing your screen. And then, uh, Brennan, over to you. Thanks so much. Okay, I'm hoping that everyone can uh, can see this. So uh, thanks again to the organizers for putting on this great event and for their uh, their work in promoting this technology for the nuclear industry. I am uh, I'm very impressed that they've been so successful at actually implementing practical um, experiments uh, within the industry already. So. Uh, to tell you a little bit about uh, Oro, we're a company that uh, is Canadian, founded in 2017. Uh, we do business uh, in the nuclear industry, but we've come from a background in financial services, life sciences, and aviation. 
which are all highly regulated industries uh, and have prepared us well for um, navigating some of the um, interesting things that you need to learn uh, as a new vendor in the nuclear industry. So our products are around identity and access management with biometrics, um, facial recognition access controls, uh, document management and process management systems for quality controls in the life sciences industry. And we've been uh, very active here in Canada in terms of uh, implementing uh, body temperature cameras for Canada's 15 largest airports uh, in partnership with the Canadian Air Transport Security Agency. Uh, so with that, I'll jump into some work that we're doing with our partner, uh, Arc Nuclear, uh, which is a, uh, a US company with a Canadian subsidiary where it's uh, small modular reactor development is taking place. Uh, Arc Canada is uh, based in New Brunswick, Canada, and I'm uh, based in Halifax, Nova Scotia. So we're we're fairly close by, geographically speaking. And uh, Arc has uh, has been a fantastic partner so far in bringing us into a consortium of uh, world class players, including uh, G Hitachi Nuclear Energy, uh, Worley, Acom, and uh, so Arc has uh, has some. Um, uh, made some significant advancements in terms of, of uh, completing its uh, first phase of design approval with the um, Canadian uh, nuclear regulator, the CNSC, and has some exciting funding announcements that are being uh, teased in the press this uh, this week by the uh, the government of New Brunswick. So uh, we're delighted to be part of this, uh, this uh, exciting uh, new um, innovative technology, frankly. Uh, and to look at how technologies such as blockchain can enhance its uh, security. So uh, we're relatively early in terms of the uh, the journey here with Arc uh, compared to some of our projects, which are you know in full production with uh, you know with our large publicly traded clients in other industries. Um, but uh, we've identified a number of areas, and and just from a high level perspective. Um, Nuclear security has basically taken the approach, and I mean on the digital side of, uh, you know, really not interacting with the outside world. So we have a uh, perhaps a server, uh, it's got important uh, information on it, and it's generally not connected to any uh, any cloud or, or off offsite um, uh, counterparts. And so in the context of deploying uh, small modular reactors, which are by their nature decentralized, some of that thinking around how do we protect uh, information and the digital integrity of uh, nuclear security systems has to be rethought um, because of the inherently decentralized nature of putting these small modular reactors into disparate geographic locations in the field. Uh, so some of the uh, the work that we've done so far to date on um, on uh, on this consortium with Arc includes looking at how uh, Oro's existing solutions, which are are active in um, in other industries, can be adapted to solve some of the challenges that the uh, the Arc consortium faces in um, designing uh, both the uh, the reactors themselves, but also in creating a center of excellence uh, for manufacturing these reactors uh, within Canada. So that means creating a manufacturing supply chain that can build and transport ARC's technology worldwide. And this requires an onboarding of a large number of different partners, vendors, employees, and contractors. Uh, this is where uh, the identity, so the, the um, digital identity concept uh, comes in. So being able to verify identities, perform background checks, and share that information within the consortium so as not to have to repeat those processes. Um, we've decided that this is a, a direction that, uh, that we'd like to pursue. Um, in terms of the supply chain, uh, the files themselves, design files, can be uh, essentially certified using the blockchain to detect any changes that were uh, perhaps made as these files were transferred uh, during the design uh, and manufacturing process. And we can also use blockchain for uh, the provenance or authenticity of, uh, of various parts as they are, um, are created for these small modular reactors. 
Uh, so I'll, I'll use the term tamper evident instead of immutable. So the difference being, uh, whereas these files are not actually stored on the blockchain, they could be changed by a malicious actor uh, as they're shared. Uh, but with blockchain, that tampering becomes evident and the system is resilient enough to detect it in real time and not to rely on uh, you know, a typical IT security approach of, of doing audits after the fact, which actually generally do not detect data breaches or, or issues around uh, data manipulation until uh, late after the fact, if ever. Um, one of the other, uh, the other areas uh, you know, we think is quite promising is the use of, um, of blockchain to track disparate processes across uh, different information systems for compliance and regulatory purposes. So this is something that we already do with our client GlaxoSmithKline in the life sciences industry, digitizing both the documents and the process management itself to make it third party verifiable. In other words, to be able to prove that certain quality related processes were carried out uh, at the right time by the right people, signed off using verifiable digital identities and to put all this into a mathematically verifiable uh, platform where uh, a regulator can review these types of, uh, of um, certifications. So I think that's probably my five minutes and I will, uh, I will pass it back to uh, Gabby. Oh, or, or to me. Um, great, thank you. Uh, Gabby will make sure she's gonna um, uh, move the presenter box. Uh, but thank you for that. And I, I appreciate uh, the presenters, essentially I'm putting them through a lightning round uh, to give a five minute opening uh, remarks or comments about the work that they're doing. And uh, next, uh, and we will do a Q&A after this. So I will go through the presenters first, uh, a structured Q&A after, and then, uh, so be prepared, Brennan and Kim, for uh, some questions uh, at the end. Next is Jasmine and Lovely. So Jasmine Auda is the Deputy Managing Director at the Middle East Scientific Institute for Security at MISA, uh, located in Amman, Jordan. Welcome. It is such a pleasure to see you, Jasmine. Last time we saw each other was in February uh, at the International Conference for Nuclear Security at the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna. It seems like a lifetime ago. And at that, at the ICONS, you were awarded the, what was it, the Young Professional uh, Award. Um, Young Professionals Competition is, uh, is what you won there. And you were speaking about blockchain and nuclear security. So it's a pleasure to be able to uh, welcome you to the panel, as well as lovely Umayam, who is a longtime colleague of mine at the Simpson Center. She is now a non-resident fellow uh, with Simpson's Blockchain and Practice Program, and was most recently a, a fellow with Simpson's Trade Technology and Security Platform, or STEP. She is also a founder of Bomb Shelto Policy and Arts Collective, and a former program manager within DOE and the NNSA. So first, Jasmine, I will pass it over to you, and then uh, Lovely will be will be will follow you. Jasmine, thank you very much, Cindy, for the introduction. Um, I'd like to start off by saying that um, first of all, unlike my very distinguished panelists today, I myself am not a blockchain expert, and I'm really just starting to learn about its non cryptocurrency applications. Um, I'm trying, sorry, to just share my screen. Um, I hope that's uh, showing. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I personally stumbled upon the concept of um, blockchain and nuclear security really by happenstance. Um, I represent an NGO that's based in Jordan that works on enhancing nuclear security. And oh, sorry, it's not centered. It's better. Gabby, is that better in terms of the? Could you move it to the left more, please? To the left more. Yeah. Um, if it's if it's a problem, um, or is there a way to share the screen? It's yeah. So it's okay. Um, would you be able to share it on my behalf, or it's 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 just the one slider. Sorry about that. Sure, I, I think it's okay. I think it's okay. We can keep going. Yeah, we can keep going. Okay. Um, so we work on regional cooperation on nuclear security, and this is primarily done through capacity building. 
And what this essentially does is that it creates the sense of trust in the institutions that are responsible for carrying out nuclear security functions, um, but as well as a trust in the countries they represent as well. So I then became really interested in this notion of trust, and that's particularly because of the region that I'm from, which is characterized by a very perceptible deficiency in trust. And I was therefore motivated to explore in what ways it could impact nuclear security. And for me, that's when I started thinking about blockchain and the role that it could potentially play in the region, um, given the shreds of knowledge that I knew about the so-called trust machine. So in the Middle East today, there are just a number of countries that um, have announced plans to go nuclear, with the first program in the Arab world having started operations just a few months ago. And um, at the same time, though, you do have this relatively weak and fragmented nuclear security framework. And while this is the case on the global level, it's just a lot more pronounced in the region because you have political instability and non-state actors, as well as um, a lack of sustained regional cooperation on critical security issues. So in consideration of how, and more importantly, why blockchain could potentially enhance nuclear security, a few ideas started to emerge. As far as cooperation was concerned, Nuclear security is really thought to be successful in encouraging discourse and collaboration on technical issues. Um, and at the same time, perhaps more conceptually, you have this idea that blockchain is something that can either create a sense of trust or allow you to operate in its absence. And further to that is really just the fundamental aspect of the technology, which is capable of creating this system with inherently transparent and immutable mechanisms, or perhaps uh, tamper evident, as um, Brennan mentioned, um, thereby generating what's referred to as the single source of truth. And finally, even though it's probably too soon to assess how this could work, if it would work, there nonetheless does need to be a sustained discourse on not just blockchain, but other innovative technologies and how they can potentially contribute to sustaining and strengthening nuclear security. Now, as posited by the research of First of all, our host and my fellow panelists from the Stimson Center, there's more than one area where blockchain could support nuclear security. My interest in the context of the Middle East was that of transport security in particular. And I won't really go into detail about why such a tracking system for nuclear material, um, how it could actually function, mostly because I can't, um, but I'll just very briefly mention a couple of reasons for why transport security could be a good candidate as a pilot in the region. First off, if the interest, like mine, is in regional cooperation, I think that probably nothing highlights the transnational nature of nuclear um, security threats more than transport. And this is especially true for the Middle East, where you have uh, uh, what's considered to be a very border dense region. Second, nuclear operators are actually getting really good at protecting their own facilities. Um, so that risk has been largely reduced to, um, to some extent through things like physical protection measures. Um, but the supply chain, however, remains highly vulnerable. And what this means is that, you know, we need to start looking outward at some of these transportation risks and how they can affect countries. And finally, we have some very unique challenges that are specific to nuclear security, particularly because it operates in the public domain. And this means that potential external adversaries can choose the when and where of a possible attack. And in the region, again, the issue of insider threats in particular is still relatively new. So my thinking was that regional actors might actually be a lot more amenable to dedicating um, resources to this potential application, one that looks out rather than in. Um, the idea of a blockchain-based application in the Middle East is really just that, um, an idea. But the region, I think, is probably in somewhat of an advantageous position um, mostly because a lot of its power programs are still in their initial conception phases. So they do have the luxury of time. Um, but at the end of the day, there would have to be a, you know, more proofs of concept or use cases in this domain before the technology not only can be embraced, but even to have its implementation seriously considered by not just the region, but um, elsewhere as well. And I'm cognizant of the time, so I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jasmine, and lovely. I will uh, pass it on to you. I know that you do not have a slide to share, uh, so um, over to you for your uh, opening remarks. Great, hello, everyone. Thank you for having me um, in this very uh, international panel.
Sorry, just checking with me. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt you, but um, does everybody else? Uh, how is it? You're sounding very broken up to me, very digitized. Uh, so I just want to make sure that people can hear you. Um, oh, it's coming out very broken. No, that's okay. That's better. Let's try that again. Sorry. Uh, that's not helping at all, actually. So I don't know if it's your microphone or if it's your internet connection. Let's try it with that. No, that's not any better. There we go. Let's take off your video, see if that makes a difference. Yeah. Is this uh, much better? Much better. Yep. Um, Lovely, sorry, I have to interrupt again. It is difficult to, to hear you. So I think what I'll do lovely, is I will pass this on to Alina and Veronica next, and then we will come back to you. Is that okay? Just to, to give you yes. some time to either check it out in another room. All right, I no problem. So. We're working the digital age. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, <laughs> um, next then is uh, we will actually move on to some incubating of use cases. Uh, specifically in Finland and in Argentina. And it's a pleasure for me to be able to introduce these two speakers. Uh, Alina Martika, as uh, we have been collaborating together on a on Slatka, which is a prototype first uh, for nuclear material accounting um, that was developed. And Alina is the head of the international cooperation at STUP, uh, the Radiation and Nuclear Safety Authority of Finland. And she has been working with the regulatory body for 30 years now and has strong competence. Uh, I would see high expertise uh, in safeguards and non-proliferation. So Alina, over to you, and then I will introduce uh, Veronica afterwards. And Alina, remember to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, thank you very much. And uh, it's very, uh, very nice to be to be present in this kind of international webinar. And this is my second webinar to, to, tonight. <laughs> so, so uh, thank you very much. My, uh, my introduction is about the Slavka, very strange name, but it's made by Cindy and, uh, and uh, it's talk about the blockchain prototype for nuclear safeguards information management system in, in Finland. By the way, Slavka name is coming from the name of Safka, which is our national, national uh, uh, accounting database at Stuk. And it does not mean, mean anything. So I try to move to the next. Mm. It's not working. Just a minute. No. Maybe Gabby, you need to help me to move to the next. I, I can't do it. I can share the presentation on my end. Just give me one second. OK, thank you. It's not moving. And Lena, then you can stop sharing your screen and then Gabby will be able to share hers. Yeah. No I tried to do that. Okay. And Alina, would you mind turning your video back on? Looks good. Yeah, the next, please. Okay, and uh, now now to the business. Uh, our challenge in Finland uh, is the mission for a thousand years and more. And uh, and for for now, the safeguards reports are current, currently sent by the unauthenticated and unencrypted email. And we don't, do not have any formal checks that report sent to the IAEA and Stuk are identical. And uh, the big, big issue, what is, uh, what is just uh, 
just behind the door is the final repository for the spent fuel and this is the first in the world and the next year uh, next year the uh, op uh, operating company posiva will apply the license for operate this facility and uh, we have uh, the time schedule that the operating license is ready in 2024 and in the same time the commissioning tests and everything should be ready from the safe cast point of view also and then the operation of the facility will will last for 100 years and more so we have we have to do everything very correctly in in time and now we are now we are thinking how we can confirm the continuity of knowledge for 100 years thousand years and more this is really the challenge and how we can be sure that the safe cash reports are correct and the information at the IAEA, in our case also European Commission, and the state is identical for one, one century, the operational time and, and also, also more. This is, this, is the, this is the challenge. And next. And uh, for, uh, for that, uh, fuel nuclear material that goes into the repository becomes impossible to access when you have encapsulated the fuel and it's going to, to, to the bedrock and will be disposed forever. There is no possibility to make any re-verification for that. And so it is so important that the consistent and unfalsiable safe gas records exist at the IAEA, European Commission and the state. And uh, the lifespan of the records is, as I said, uh, more than 1,000 years, and uh, records should include uh, IAEA conclusions too, that when IAEA is doing the conclusions by the safe gas agreement and the additional protocol, we have to store them, uh, store them in our database for, for years and years. And also the most, most of the safe gas information is confidential, so the information security issue is very important for us. So we are dreaming how to make this, how to make this happen and how, how to do the things in, in the better way. And, and the next slide with is my last one. We have, uh, we have done together with Stimson Center and uh, the University of South Wales of uh, Australia. Uh, to study what is, what is thinking, what is blockchain for safeguards. And uh, I think that this is very good starting point uh, that that we can think about how we can manage manage to do with the uh, with the challenges with the final repository and also the also the practical safe gas uh, safe gas reporting to the to the IAEA in the future in the modern 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 way not using this kind of uh, email systems. Thank you very much. Great. So thank you so much, Alina. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to be able to work with Duke and, and UNSW on SLAFCA. And uh, just to do a plug, the final report, uh, we're just in the process of finalizing that, and uh, we'll be able to publish that online in the next few weeks. So stay tuned uh, okay. for, the, for the SLAFCA report. Yeah, uh, next, actually, we will pass it on to Veronica. And Veronica is uh, the blockchain architect at the National Atomic Energy Commission, CNEA. Uh, in uh, Argentine, it's the Argentine National Atomic Energy Commission. She's been there for 10 years and she works with user machine interfaces for nuclear control room systems and with human factor engineering in the process control department. She is currently responsible for blockchain technology in the information security department and developing uh, courses responsible on different topics in relation to information security. We've had some challenges with Veronica's uh, internet as well, but we do have a video uh, of her presentation, which we will share, and then she will be able to join us live um, for the Q&A. So Gabby, over to you to share that uh, presentation on YouTube. And we can also make that available, that link on our website as well. Gabby, we cannot hear it.
Hello everybody. Before we begin, let me introduce myself. I'm Veronica Lucchini and I work at the Information Security Department from the Argentinian Atomic Energy Commission. Today I'm going to talk about NMAC blockchain prototype. As I will go over the mentioned before, blockchain will improve nuclear industry and any international government process. Think about proliferation. Now, will we help to prevent it? Our application will be used to register each nuclear material movement, avoiding the misuse of radioactive source or nuclear waste. But our challenge specifically are how to extend information security, how to introduce DLT in nuclear, and finally, how DLT will improve the stability of nuclear material and uh, duplicated material. material. The nuclear material accounting and control system known as NMAC is a key issue. As it stands, blockchain is a complete software solution that ensures information security. Um, information security is a milestone in nuclear science. Let's examine NMAC blockchain in more depth. NMAC blockchain is a private blockchain where each nuclear material movement is written into a block. Segment, the transfer of any nuclear material are some of possible operations that will be registered in our NMAC blockchain. Each block set information about material custodian, material location, radioactive values, and so on. DLT technology brings us the solution for transparency and that data protection that we ensure that the physical identification, this is the that is the tamper identification device, is also registered into the block with information about the provider or the manufacturer. Each facility will know which recycled material and in which area, in which material balance area is this material, is the material recycled. And that's not all. In my blockchain, will allow regulators to avoid all movement of several nuclear power, power plants and therefore the international authority around the world. The most essential feature of this technology is that it is user-friendly. User go into a new application or a new website and perform all operations as usual. Therefore, the blockchain is implemented in a transparent way. Our solution will be implemented from a signal facility a NIL, to the complete fuel site. It is important to tell you that this prototype is not implemented yet. We would like to present the idea to our college from Safeboard and Nuclear Safety and also to our authority or regulator. Let me review the key point from this session. In my blockchain, cover the immutable security information aspect. DLT brings us the solution for transparency in nuclear material traceability. This prototype is the beginning. We want this work to inspire nuclear sector to adopt new technological paradigms that support nuclear security. That's all. Thank you very much for Cindy, for Gabriel, 
and see you in another time. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. And as I mentioned, that will be uh, that video will be available on the event page. So, uh, in case there were any difficulties in, in hearing that, depending on the uh, internet stream, uh, it should be much better on the uh, event page. But in essence, one of the things that I think is so interesting about the two use cases just um, discussed by Alina and Veronica is. In the Slavka case, it's much more looking at nuclear safeguards information management, the different transactions and reporting requirements uh, under the EU regulation and how they are um, transmitted into the IAEA uh, in the comprehensive safeguards agreements. And looking also at the nuclear material accounting side that Veronica just mentioned, the tamper indicating advices, the TIDs is also registered on a DLT. And I think that's also as another layer of understanding and how a DLT can be applied across a number of different aspects. So lovely, I am going to turn it over to you and sorry, I have a fly uh, that is uh, flying around me at the moment, but lovely, let's see how your uh, internet uh, connection and voice is working. Are you able to share your picture or just your voice? Um, so I just unmuted myself. Um, hopefully this is a lot better. Um, I'm a, that sounds wonderful. Fantastic. And I'm a little bit reticent to turn on my video. So uh, you'll just have to, to hear me speak. But um, I'm so sorry for the technical difficulties, but I'm really glad to be here. And actually, I think this dovetails more nicely um, um, after uh, hearing the presentations by Alina um, and Veronica, because um, what I was trying to say earlier was that while I'm a uh, I do not really have a lot of knowledge on blockchain. What really piqued my interest in this topic is uh, these prototypes that look at the possible benefits of NMAC or nuclear material accounting and control. And now you've you've heard all about it. Um, but as as Cindy said, you know this really has an eye towards safeguards, or at least uh, these prototypes. Uh, uh, with respect to NMAC, there are aspects that seem to naturally um, lend itself to security, particularly if uh, DLT makes it harder to manipulate information. Um, as Kim mentioned earlier about the hashing function that DLT provides, and this idea of um, providing alerts in real time when something has been altered to um, Brennan's point earlier. So that's when, as a nuclear policy researcher, the question started to roll for me, uh, thinking about how DLT can provide timely detection if information had been inappropriately accessed, uh, which I think also allows for timely response. Um, and I think this could also perhaps deter a bad actor from trying to do something fishy in the first place because the data theft or sabotage just would be harder to pull off. So through this frame, um, it struck me that DLT is not a literal barrier or a cybersecurity patch that creates or strengthens the defenses around a perimeter, which I think is a typical image associated with nuclear security. Um, I was more, I think, intrigued by the idea of it as a complementing security feature that is embedded in the data itself as it is stored or exchanged. And when combining the idea of DLT with smart sensors that can monitor environmental conditions, as Kim mentioned earlier, I wondered if this could offer um, continuous surveillance whereby DLT sort of has the feed of, of data about a given room or cask or truck, and this data would be harder to alter or fake. Um, I, I didn't come into this research with an expectation that any of this would come to fruition. Um, but it had enough meat for me to investigate what um, is possible and helpful. Uh, before it about other use cases for us to examine, I wanted to touch on a few challenges first, because I think that they help give a flavor of what it's like to think about DLT for nuclear security. Um, I think the first is uh, rather obvious, but I think I'm going to mention it anyway. Um, no one really wants to talk about or admit to specific security vulnerabilities in our space. So more often we hear that either things are secured the way they are, or that yes, we can use more robust measures, but you know we can't really talk about the details for obvious security reasons. Um, and while this culture of confidentiality um, is a pillar of nuclear security, 
um, I must admit that the opaqueness makes it difficult to hone in on a specific problem. And I think because of this, it's a lot easier to dismiss the application of new technologies like DLT as a solution blindly seeking a problem. So hopefully that sort of makes sense. Um, the second thing that I wanted to mention is that nuclear security is the sole responsibility of the state. There is no international body that tells countries what to do in this space. And within the country, it's the license holders, the operators that are the frontline implementers of security because they are the ones handling nuclear material. Um, this is all to say that operators are a key actor here um, and they must understand the value proposition of DLT, especially how it impacts costs and other organizational considerations. So something, um, you know, can something simpler or cheaper do the job just as well? Um, will this play nice with existing systems? And this is largely unknown and it can quickly become a chicken and egg scenario um, where no one wants to test the tech without answers to these questions, but you can't really get that data until you test. Um, and I know I'm, I'm running out of time here, so I'll briefly mention the other two use cases that seem most promising to me. Um, the first, uh, I think, could potentially address um, insider threat mitigation. Uh, very much in line with Brennan's uh, presentation, you know, storing relevant um, employee information on the chain to track and validate certain activities. And I think he mentioned it um, in sharing it with a consortium um, so as not to repeat the process. But what I had in really, you know, can we track uh, uh, personnel activity when they're moving nuclear material from one place to another? Um, DLT for this reason could create a digital trail for employees, which may have interesting implications for security culture. Um, and then the other, I just wanted to add to um, Jasmine's point earlier about transport security, because I absolutely agree. Um, you know, it's material is most vulnerable in transit because of all the routes, timing, paperwork, um, actors involved. And I'm particularly interested in looking at how DLT could help harmonize digital information associated with the given shipment. So that could be trucker credentials, relevant checkpoints, um, security plans with the actual physical movement of material. Um, so linking relevant stakeholders, senders, shippers, recipients, regulators through this ledger might allow for improved data transparency and management, which then decreases the likelihood of foul play. Um, so thank you. I, I think I'll just stop there and we can dig deeper in the Q&A. Great, lovely. And you came across crystal clear. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I have a couple of questions first before we turn it over to the floor, uh, so to speak, or to the digital floor. Uh, and if I could actually go back to, to Kim and Brendan in particular. Uh, blockchain, of course, has a mixed perception. Uh, in some cases, it's already being used in uh, commercial applications, even in for some specific countries. But at the same time, it also receives a great deal of skepticism from critics. Can you speak to the trial and error uh, working with blockchain and navigating a space that's still seeking main, uh, a mainstream acceptance and adoption? Uh, how about I start with Brennan and then I'll go to Kim. Um, yeah, so... I think the key to navigating that is to really focus as opposed to focusing on the technology to focus on the business problems uh, and value of solving those problems and then to be a little bit more agnostic on the way that we get there. So in some of our projects, um, we might implement uh, systems that do not even involve blockchain. Um, it's a tool in the toolbox that has specific advantages over other tools in specific instances, but not all instances. So, um, <clears throat> you know, I'll, I'll be maybe a bit more specific. So, you know, talking about safety and identity and access management, uh, I'll give the example of, let's say we have a, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, I don't want to get too technical here, but Let's say we have a list of people that are, um, uh, they have certain privileges to act within uh, either accessing certain physical areas of a building or certain um, information systems. And the way that that's traditionally managed is in something called an active directory, which is you essentially have names of people, uh, email addresses, credentials, passwords, 
Um, and that is stored in a traditional database. So that can be modified by a hacker. Uh, that hacker can then change those uh, permissions and privileges so that they can access different parts of a system. Uh, and one of the things that I get most excited about in terms of blockchain and security is the idea of actually uh, putting all of those, um, all those identities, credentials, uh, into the blockchain itself and then using smart contracts or executable code that are also on the blockchain to define those permissions and also to track the activity of those people through different information systems or physical areas. So uh, hopefully that's a concrete example of an advantage of, of a blockchain-based security system over a traditional system. And happy to elaborate on that if anyone wants to dive deeper offline. Great, thank you. Uh, Kim, any thoughts on your end? Um, yeah, so a couple of thoughts, and actually I echo the same sentiment that Ramins has. Um, you know, one of, I think um, there are a couple um, thoughts here. The first and foremost is that it's everywhere, it's around us, is smart technologies. We all have it. But how, how secure do we feel about it or until we wait until something goes wrong? So this is, yeah, that's one thing. That's the first thing you need to think of. But when implement a, um, I think if you have a pain point that you would like to ease, smart technologies can not enable that. It can help you solve that issue. But then you go back to the first and foremost is governance. That is what will help you navigate through the new technologies, there's a smart technologies today. You have to ask the question, who owns it? Who operates it? How do we trust it? I think that having the parties come to the table and talk about that, then you can really script and build the framework using all the smart technologies. Blockchain is one where, you know, I'm one, don't, it's not, that you can use blockchain in all. It can be an enabler. It can be a small part in the whole enterprise. It's an augment, that's how I see it. If it helps to facilitate or ease the pain point, then we solve it with that. If not, then we use different technologies. Great, actually, if I can uh, pull on that thread. Uh, so I have heard, and, and, and what you're saying there too, is that blockchain is a layer, it's, it's an augmentation. And a lot of people will say that the power of blockchain really also lies in its uh, how it's combined with other technologies. So, Kim, if you could talk about that a little bit more, and then Brennan, I'll ask you to to come in as well. Yeah. So, if we're, you know, when you build the framework, there's still the enterprise. You have the uh, the uh, the uh, infrastructure, but there's a piece that it's like we move from a paper to a digital. You have digital assets or artifacts. What do you do with that? How do you secure that? How do you monitor that? And that's where blockchain can come in and help. Today, if you go, you know, do you really trust the, the digital artifacts or asset? Has it been altered? So that's what blockchain can bring in is that it can really make it tamper proof so that when you look at something, you say, yes, it is what it is because, you know, that hash, if something is tampered, it's not, it's going to come back as error. It's not going to show you anything. Uh, so it comes down to, and I say this and I'll tell people, I, I always tell this to people, are you who you said you are? Same thing can be said about a digital um, asset. But in terms of other technologies, I mean, machine learning, artificial intelligence, IoT, you touched on the IoT side of things. How is it that that combination of other technologies and blockchain, what is it about that that helps to uh, increase the security, trans, uh, the transparency and the immutability side of things? Oh, okay. So, uh, you know, it, it comes down to really uh, managing your data. How do you manage your data, your digital data in the IoT, in the device, as it, you know, as it captures that and it emits? How do you manage that? How do you want to secure that data? And that's where blockchain can really help to 
move that along and authenticate that transaction. Um, it doesn't have to be the content. The content can be off chain and housed in a store, yeah, in a regular storage database. But if that content is, let's say, um, been altered, then the whole transaction be known and invalid. Same thing on AI and ML. The one thing that I do want to talk about, and it's something that it's on the crust right now, but is that with AI and M, uh, ML, the thing that we have to really, really start to think about and talk is compliance. You know, there's a lot of algorithm whereby it could be somewhat biased. So there needs to be talk about governance and compliance in that area and how it's handled. And once you do that compliance, then you can basically put it on the blockchain to say, yes, has this been, you know, um, let's say AI ML compliant, block it so that someone can verify and authenticate, yes, it has been, so therefore I can use it, especially in the government space. Sorry, great, thank you. Brennan, and uh, thoughts on your end in the combination of, of technologies? Uh, I mean, it, it's always difficult to sort of sort the buzzword bingo applications <laughs> from the real applications. Uh, I mean, I would say that, you know, blockchain by itself is is not that useful a technology. It's very important to combine it with existing systems to harden them um, and not necessarily combining blockchain with uh, technology like AI, emer other emerging technologies, but combining things like uh, biometric authentication with a blockchain based identity and access management system. And then maybe layering that on to you know an existing um, an existing IT stack at a client uh, to harden it essentially. So that's where we see the most uh, traction from our our clients is where we're enabling new processes or processes with better compliance or um, enhancements to existing technology by you know uh, attaching blockchain with an API. Uh, to those existing systems, because very few um, organizations, whether they be private or public, are willing to replatform um, onto an entirely new um, solution. So, being able to interact readily with any existing technology or you know uh, on-premise systems cloud, private cloud, that's basically table states to do real things in blockchain, my opinion. Great, thank you. Uh, I will put now uh, Jasmine and Lovely on the spot, uh, particularly as they have been going through the process as, as policy wonks, policy experts in the field. What has your learning curve been as you've been uh, researching blockchain? And what are the concepts that are still unclear to you that require more research, especially as, as it pertains to bringing this type of technology to the nuclear field? How about Jasmine, we start with you. Sure. Thank you, Cindy. Um, so for me personally, it's been very steep <laughs> as far as learning curve is concerned. I think that I know um, still very little about how the technology itself operates. And the more that I learn about it, the more questions I really have as to how this would fit in with the particularities of the nuclear field itself. So actually, a lot of the questions that I have were kind of echoed by Lovely um, during her during her um, talk because, and I think that's a testament to the fact that we're both looking at it from more of a policy lens rather than a technical lens. But for me, and I think from practitioners' perspectives in general, the concern will always be what resources and capacities would be required in order to actually implement the system at their facilities. So there are a lot of knowledge gaps regarding issues such as cost and what integration with other systems um, that are already in place would look like. Um, but more fundamentally, again, is the question about, you know, if they decide to embrace this technology, is this really the only um, route that they can be going down? Um, Brennan also mentioned that, you know, in and of itself, maybe it won't be super useful. It should be combined with the, with other systems and technologies as well. So they would always have to consider if it can be supplanted by existing lower cost proven alternatives. And I don't know if the answers to these questions are out there, but um, they probably necessitate learning a lot more about the technology and its functionality and probably seeing a lot more case studies in the future as well. Lovely, your thoughts. 
Sure. And I felt bold enough to uh, share my video. So. <laughs> Oh, no, you're not good. You'll have to, you'll have to stop your video. <laughs> I did implode. Is this better? Okay. Okay. I think you were too bold, lovely. I think we were too bold because you are cutting in and out again. So I will go to the next question and then come back to you um, after as well. Uh, so actually, I'll move on to and just a note to others in the uh, attendees uh, that you can direct questions to uh, Gabby, to the host uh, or to all panelists. And, uh, and I will get to you or we will get to you. Certainly, I just want to ask um, Alina and Veronica a question first, and then we can pass it back to lovely to see how she's doing. But specifically to, to both of you, what has been the most surprising observations from your prototypes uh, from a technological standpoint? What is DLT, what is blockchain capable of? And also from an organizational standpoint, how the technology interacts with existing processes and systems. And uh, Veronica, why don't we start with you? Okay. Um, well, um, from the technological point of view, the ability of blockchain to reveal information through the copies that exist in the network node is incredible, especially when an attack for of information has been served. Also, um, from the operational point of view, it is very easy to make any transaction such as the chain custodian of nuclear material in real time. And focus on organizational aspects, um, the traceability that is uh, achieved, achieved sorry, by using blockchain is great. Um, we were able to take in our organization the feasibility of safeguarding other types of, of assets. And to mention an example, Konea is developing one more blockchain prototype to the external documenter system. Um, this case of use will help us to solve the management of every documenter around the state and to inform each institution about the measurement results. And currently, this system is already up and approved um, by the regulator, but we want to, to add um, some, some issues as the instability of the system information that being the blockchain technology. Great, thank you. Alina, what are your thoughts about the technical side and the organizational side? Yeah, I'm not very deeply involved about the technical capabilities of this system. Somebody else did it for us, but uh, but uh, from the organizational point of view, I was very surprised. I know it in advance, but I was very surprised about the transparency of the system and uh, this that you can you can at the same time follow the system in in operator, in regulator, in Luxembourg and in Vienna, in IAEA. So it's it's very very good to have the uh, this kind of online system that you can have the same data with everybody in the same time and you can you can be sure that all the all the parties have the exactly the same information because because for example in the safeguards reports you have you have to make sometimes the corrections and then you send the correction and uh, and uh, they 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 receive it or they 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 don't and uh, and and it's it's you you never know what what is the version what they have and of course if you have able to check the inventory then you can then then you can find the uh, mistakes but if you are not able to check the inventory then then you will have a trouble in for example in our final repository case and i see that many many uh quite many questions in the uh, in the questions and answer panel that they are asking about the regulatory requirements for, for this kind of DLT system. And we were also thinking about this in when we started uh, our study. And, uh, and uh, I think that there is no 
no extra requirements by the regulator. Every state has the, that has the requirement how to handle this kind of confidential information. And for, ex in, for example, in Finland, they are very, very tight requirement comparing to some other countries, like example for in the European Union. But I think that it's not a problem. And when we compare this for the existing system, sending confidential data by email, I think that this is this is much safe, and uh, and also also for example the IAEA safeguards are using the remote data transmission in the nuclear power plants, and what is the security issues for for that? So I think that that it's manageable. No, and there is a, that's that's not a big issue, but of course it has to be discussed in every every state according to the uh, state requirements. Great, thank you. Lovely. Let's try you one more time. All right. Uh, hopefully this is clear again. It is. Um, awesome. So I, I just wanted to say uh, that I think there's a delicate balance in being open minded to learning everything one can learn about something new. Um, and at the same time, retaining a healthy dose of skepticism and questioning everything. And what has really been helpful for me is talking to blockchain um, companies that provide authentication and tracing services for high value minerals like diamonds, uh, lithium, or even e-waste and thinking about parallels with nuclear material. Um, and some of the uh, outstanding questions I have, um, and perhaps others in the audience may have them as well, is you know, what kind of information should actually be stored in the blockchain or what existing databases can benefit from a DLT layer? Um, and my guess is that this will depend on the conditions of the problem, right? So if it's for nuclear transport as a case study, we would need to have to work in collaboration with operators and transporters to map out um, the ecosystem of information um, within that space to determine what makes most sense to test out on a blockchain, uh, even if it's testing with dummy data to start. Um, I wouldn't be able to answer that without the ground truth from stakeholders that will ultimately use it. And I think that's really important to, to note. Um, but I think there's also some confusion about what exactly is stored on the blockchain. Um, we've received questions about is it the actual data or is it the signature or metadata um, that's actually stored. Um, and if there is time to loop back to Brennan or um, Kim, I would love to hear their thoughts on this because um, I have heard that it doesn't necessarily have to be the sensitive, you know, classified information on the blockchain, but rather a signature of it. So you actually know um, who has accessed it um, and whether it's been changed or not. And that's where the provenance um, comes from. And then the last thing that I wanted to mention um, in terms of the technical side of things, um, I'm still trying to figure out the meaning and significance of uh, interoperability um, or cross chains. From my very basic layperson understanding, this is when independent blockchains talk to each other. And uh, again, I, I think it's not quite there yet. It's still in the process of, of being developed. But this may have some implication on when we start thinking about uh, countries exchanging information and facilitating transactions. Um, and I'm sure that there is a whole, um, you know, line of questioning about the legal dimensions of that. But in any case, those are just some of the, the, the questions uh, spinning in my head. Great, wonderful. Uh, well, we'll keep spinning them uh, and, and teasing them out over time. Gabby, I'm going to turn it over to you for the next uh, 20 minutes. Uh, I see there are a number of different questions uh, that you might want to relay to the panelists. Hi, Cindy, thank you. And thank you to everyone for submitting your questions in the Q&A. We have a great number of questions and they're all really thought provoking. So if we don't get to your question, I apologize, but thank you for submitting. So first, I wanted to ask all the panelists, are there any thoughts on how regulators can support the development of blockchain in the nuclear sector? And what kind of regulations will be needed? I think this is a question Alina had spoken to, but uh, we'll open it up to the floor. Alina, feel free to elaborate a little bit more. My sense is, is that the not, not anything has to be done specifically at the IAEA, but that is something that can also be explored as it goes into uh, how to interact with other systems in the agency or maybe even your atom. 
Um, Alina, maybe a question though on uh, to follow up with you and to follow up on this question. When we're talking about operator records and state records being the same, so the same ledger, the authoritative record, uh, that is, as you mentioned, one of the things that is uh, incredibly unique about DLT and certainly eliminates a lot of time uh, and mm -hmm. book audits and book uh, inspections that needs to be done both at the state level and certainly at the IAEA. But what would happen if there was, could the IAEA and URATAM have that same system? Is there anything that would limit or a legal barrier that would stop that? Would there have to be a new regulation? Um, I don't know exactly, but uh, but during this uh, DLT study uh, to Finland, uh, we were discussing that uh, that the, from the operator to regulator to Stuk, we have the uh, how to say secured uh, secured email system, so we can we can we can send uh, many information in a secure way. But when we send the information from Stuk to Euratom, uh, Luxembourg, or to IAEA Vienna then it's the normal normal email line and we need to use some kind of encryption. So it's it's the problem. And also the IAA has prepared for the for the AP additional protocol declaration purposes, some kind of declaration portal. But uh, I, I said just a few minutes ago that, that that in Finland we have a very how to say tight requirements for the confidential data. So we are not able to use that because it's not uh, not fulfilling the fin Finland state requirements, this portal. So we have to have some other way to provide the information. And that that's also why we were thinking some kind of uh, some kind of block blockchain based uh, based system that we can really confirm that everything is in a secure way. But as this in this study, we didn't we didn't went very, very deeply to this uh, uh, to these uh, requirements and we're checking because we had only fake data, but uh, but maybe maybe that's the future. But but personally, and we have discussed in my organization and also in governmental level that that this might might be not a not a problem. Great, exactly. There certainly needs to be more uh, diving deep into this, uh, yeah. as from fictional to uh, yeah. actual my real. Systems. Yeah, and my my technical capabilities in in this DLT system are not very good, but I have understood that uh, that uh, that it has been it has been built as you like it. If you if there are some some uh, re uh, requirements or limitations, then you can prepare them. Great. And then just to follow on, sorry, Gabby, if I would just Gab, follow on with that because I think uh, Argentina might have something to say. I know Veronica, you had mentioned. Um, you have not yet uh, had long discussions with uh, your regulators yet um, about this, but do you have you had been able to have a chance to look at what the potential um, regulatory aspects may be if there is adoption of DLT? In, in our regulator body is very very conservative and traditional. In, the strategy must be designed to reduce impact generated by introducing new technology. But um, I think that we have the chance to, to teach how blockchain works and the benefits of this technology. And maybe in presentation, how mainly in reducing time and improving communication in game blockchain. And, well, we have not yet discussed, but um, we start to, to, teach, to teach the people in Konea. And we bring courses. Uh, we just finished the blockchain introduction courses. And, and I think that the cultural organization uh, arrives the technology to the regulator. Uh, we have uh, we have to work together with the uh, uh, safety nuclear department. So I think that first we need to to discuss the technology with these people and in the second time go to the regulator and show the, the prototype and how easy it is to verify information, to 
obtain the list of Castadian or material location. In, it, it is a hard work, I think. Uh, can I actually add something, Cindy, if it can hear me? Sure, and I apologize to Gabby. I'm actually, I'm giving the floor back to her. So okay. <laughs> Gabby will, uh, but I would assume yes. <laughs> okay, um, so I, uh, just from a nuclear policy um, side of things, not necessarily um, uh, with the perspective of, of um, a regulator, because I'm not one, um, I did wanna point out something that Mark um, Scheinfan said on the Q&A, uh, which I think, is something I would assume as a regulator, um, I would be have to be mindful of, which is, um, you know, the source data, right? I think we've talked about how, you know, blockchain helps enable um, or enhance processes, but you still have to make sure that whatever you plug in um, is uh, accurate, right? And untampered with. And so as a regulator, um, if I'm interested in testing this technology and, um, you know, communicating with operators, um, you know, to, to uh, increase confidence with one another, I would want to, to have a conversation about um, source data and, and ensuring that whatever is actually logged in the blockchain can be trusted. So I just wanted to, to point that out because that was the first thing that, that came to my mind. Thanks so much, Lovely. And so on that note of how DLT can enable processes, how would you demonstrate the net gain of blockchain slash DLT? So for example, showing that it creates less vulnerability as compared to current practices. So creating and raising your interest for operators and authorities. And are there any case studies that you could link this to? Um, I can tackle that. Um, I think. So um, in my research, I would actually love to get to a point where I'm testing it. So I can't really speak to um, any existing case studies that would um, prove this point. But I would imagine just based on conversations, nascent conversations with regulators and operators about blockchain, what they're really interested in is the net efficiency. I think we've talked a little bit about that in terms of reducing um, the amount of discrepancy, uh, especially when you're considering NMAC, right? Uh, making sure that um, records are reconciled between the operator um, uh, and, the, and the regulator um, so that there isn't time wasted um, or resources wasted in making sure that they line up. Um, and on the operator's end, um, at least when it comes to uh, potential use cases for nuclear security, it's all about costs, right? Um, making sure that whatever we're proposing, you know, it might be incredibly effective, but if it breaks the bank and there's a completely um, perfectly fine and cheaper alternative to do so, um, you know, I, I think operators would rather prefer to, to um, look at less expensive um, uh, alternatives. So I think it would be really uh, beneficial um, at the end of the day as we think about uh, developing test cases to, to consider um, the cost factor. Thanks, Lovely. And I'll pose this question to the other panelists as well. So on costs, have you all experienced any kind of research in the investment that would be needed for a DLT system? And are there any unique features of DLT um, as compared, compared to other technologies for nuclear security that you'd like to highlight? And then also to throw a third little loop at you, are there any risks of DLT for nuclear security? I'd like to comment. Uh, so I think that um, just on a couple of, of points, so if I could just um, hop back to the regulatory question. Looking at other industries like financial services, a regulatory sandbox is a great way for regula regulators to um, essentially encourage the adoption of new technologies like DLT or other technologies. So, uh, you know, looking at uh, an environment where these things can be tested without, um, you know, endangering um, operating certificates and things like that, uh, that encourages the operators to come together, the vendors to come together. Um, I also think that 
the costs of DLT are no longer as high as uh, as is popularly believed. Um, most modern uh, blockchain implementations are done in the cloud, and uh, you know blockchain might be uh, a fraction of the uh, the actual expense compared to the the overall spending on on the cloud services. So I think IBM says it's a, a you know, for every dollar spent on blockchain, maybe five dollars are spent on cloud services. So it's not a major driver of cost compared to just the overall level of effort to implement any new uh, software uh, solution. Um, the actual cost to process um, transactions on a cloud-based blockchain with a you know a modern consensus uh, or, or uh, computational uh, proof of um, of, uh, uh, of process authenticity are, are minimal, okay? Um, maybe I'll let the other panelists weigh in on the rest of it. Thank you, Brennan. So if another panelist wants to maybe comment on the unique features of DLT for nuclear security as compared to other existing technologies, and as well as the risks that are associated with DLT, um, I open the floor to you. And if we don't have a panelist who would like to answer that question, I might move to another question, which what are the implications for of DLT for monitoring nuclear weapons? That's a whole other ball game. Uh, that is something that uh, we are not looking at in this space. Uh, I mean, you could argue that nuclear security, of course, certainly <laughs> deals with the with nuclear weapons. Uh, and maybe Brennan, um, you might also have something to add there in terms of looking at other other case studies. But in terms of our research at Stimson specifically, and also what others, you know, who you have here in front of you are non-nuclear weapon states uh, representatives mostly. And the research we're looking at is on the civilian side of things. So safeguards, making sure that non-nuclear weapon states do not uh, have nuclear weapons. And really there, that one of the great things about the Superledger technology, what we have shown and demonstrated with Slavka, uh, so far is that diversion is able to be detected uh, immediately. Uh, so that is certainly a benefit there that would make sense also with uh, uh, the weapons side. But in terms of any research specifically, that has not been done around this group. But I don't know if there's anyone that would like to say something specifically about that. Um, I, this is lovely. Um, I think, Cindy, you're quite right that we haven't really looked at uh, the weapons side of things. Um, but I, as you were talking, you know, you talked about uh, timely response. Um, and uh, just going back to, to the last question, that's something that I would love to uh, just sort of test as a possible unique uh, characteristic or benefit that um, a DLT may provide um, nuclear security uh, relative to other existing technologies. I think um, in creating a prototype, that would be something I would love to be able to test. Um, it, it just, again, from my preliminary lit reviews and expert interviews, it seems like it, it does have, you know, real-time response. Um, and I think that that would be very um, attractive uh, uh, for, uh, you know, enhancing nuclear security measures. Um, and yeah, it would be great to be able to line that up with existing technologies that also say, well, we could um, provide uh, a similar service. It would be interesting to see what the response times are and sort of matrix that with, um, as we've already talked about costs and to Brennan's point, like perhaps, yeah, D maybe DLT is um, less costly, but it would be great to be able to, to, again, compare and contrast that with existing technologies. Um, the only, I guess, again, this is, um, just a brainstorm. Um, uh, uh, there isn't, uh, or at least I haven't really researched it on the nuclear weapons side of things, but I'd be really curious um, what the implications are of, you know, environmental monitoring. Uh, just hearing from Kim as well as Brennan this idea of pairing um, sensors, right, um, and logging whatever the feed of data. Um, is taken from those uh, sensors from the blockchain. I wonder if that could be um, another way of thinking about um, securing high assets, um, sensitive assets that could uh, be applied to, uh, you know, weapons stockpile. Thank you, lovely. And so I'll move to our final question, 
which is on engaging the DLT and queer communities. How are you all bringing these two communities together? How are you pitching DLT to maybe people who might be um, less inclined to adopt the technology? Maybe I'll start that um, actually in terms of what we've been doing. We have partnered with, um, Simpson specifically has partnered with uh, the Stanley Center, who I hope is uh, uh, attending still, uh, and uh, p and Pacific Northwest Laboratories to look at member state acceptance. And the, the one thing that we've noticed over time is certainly that, I mean, anytime you, you introduce someone to something for the first time, there is going to be skepticism as there rightly should be. We, uh, operate the nuclear field as a very conservative field, highly skeptical. Uh, nuclear technology is an incredibly disruptive technology itself. So, of course, there's a lot of caution uh, going forward in looking at other technologies. So, for us, it's it's a um, a lot of engagement over time. It's not just one or two times. But there's a lot of understanding on our end and on their end, as as both Lovely and Jasmine have talked about being from the policy side how that works from that perspective coming into it. And so that skepticism has to be there going forward, as it does also from the technology side to understand what is the governance, what are the information flows, and what are the cultural aspects also that go with the field. So it is a step-by-step -step process. Um, it really starts with what uh, Finland has done with Slavka and what CNA, CNEA is doing also there and engaging with the regulators and their other stakeholders nationally. Uh, as what Brennan is doing also with, with ARC Nuclear and then engaging with CNSC. Um, so that is part of that step-by-step -step process. Some of it will be fictional to start off with, so we can have demonstration to be able to show uh, the world uh, and, and how these things, how the technology works. And then when people understand that this technology is not Bitcoin uh, and that there are non-cryptocurrency applications that are incredibly powerful, for the work that we do uh, in the nuclear sector, then there becomes more understanding. And then that's really where the discussion comes like we're having today that can take it further forward. Thank you, Cindy. And if we don't have any other comments, I will turn it back to you for our closing remarks. Great, thank you. I want to really express my warm gratitude to the panelists. Thank you so much and for your patience through all the uh, technical difficulties that uh, exist as we telework from all over the world. Uh, really appreciate your time. Um, I also think that it would be good for us to maybe do a follow up over time to see how we are developing uh, our ideas as they go forward and really want to wish all the best to Veronica as she keeps uh, working forward in her prototype as well as with Brennan and Arc Nuclear. Uh, and to uh, Jasmine, keep working on it. You're going to become an expert before you know it. Uh, Alina, thank you also. I know it's later for both you and Jasmine. Uh, and to Kim also for participating. As a, you know, We really appreciate uh, your, uh, your time being a non-resident fellow and teaching us uh, along the way. So, and lovely. Um, also, we will continue our work looking at nuclear security. And to everyone else, if you have any other questions, please feel free to email us offline. And please also uh, take a look at the video afterwards. It will be posted online as well as the presentations. And thank you, everyone. Uh, stay healthy and safe. Bye-bye.